Hey everybody, welcome back to Movie Couple Live. Happy Saturday, I'm Wendy. Ooh, I'm Dustin. And we're introducing today, Molly's stepdad, Mark Ellis, everybody. <laughs> You, you really didn't need to say the Mark Ellis part. As soon as they hear Molly step that, they know that they tuned in for the right reason. And that is that right now there's, I probably put it at a 30% chance we see the dog today. She's had a big morning. So she's she's currently sleeping. I showed her Jaws this morning. Um, and then we went for a long walk and it's hot outside. And so she's got her water and taking a little nap. And um, she might hear Papa's voice and want to come out and see what all the commotion is about. So you never know. On. what's going on i feel like she's more of kind of like excuse me i'm trying to nap can you keep <laughs> it down over there Thanks. <laughs> yeah yeah she actually a, a lot like jaws she just did a pass like how the, oh look look at who it is there she Special is. Appearance. oh my Hi, god oh, that's that the is... cutest ever <laughs> molly our dogs don't do that to us no nah, they don't uh... they don't come and do kisses Oh yeah, she's a sweet little girl. She yeah, she'll do a drive by. Sometimes she'll like when I'm just like sitting watching TV, she'll do a drive by licking for whatever reason. She just goes by and she just like licks my knee, and it's like, <laughs> and then she just keeps going about her business. She's like, tag, you're it. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a uh, it's a full time job. Um, I don't confuse myself with what actual parents of you know humans go through, but. She is uh, she's a handful and it's worth every every moment. Abs Aww. Absolutely right. That's how we feel about our dogs. We just invested. It was like forty dollars worth of like teeth, like good for their teeth <laughs> chewing products from Petco. And I'm just like, we bought toothpaste, two different types of chew toys, all these like toothbrush items, and then we tried it on Falcor and he absolutely hated it. <laughs> He's like, Yeah, this ain't for me. Yeah, we tried brushing his teeth yeah. with a brush. It was a no go. Yeah, they'll uh, they, they'll do that, and and then it's this thing like you never thought they would enjoy that, that that's like becomes their best friend. Like, who would have thought this thing? Like two years later, this is still. What was I, I've it, it it I don't know what it used. I think it used to be like an art bark, and then it just got really. <laughs> small. I'm I'm showing them what you do to your so-called friends, Molly. Um, and then. We got this uh, this chicken one got pretty it's it's on its literal oh last leg. Yeah. But like I bought her so many toys since this and she still this is her go to every time. So I come yeah, on. That's amazing. What is it? Um Navi stole one of uh, Grace's dog's toys. Um it was like a little um... it was a bunny that rat played with and when we all used to bring dogs into the first collider office Navi and Ratsy met for the first time and yeah. Navi just she just basically took over Rat's space. She's like, <laughs> I'm sleeping in her bed, I'm drinking out of her water, I'm eating out of her bowl, and I'm stealing this bunny. And I was like, Navi, you and can't this do bunny this. Is she's now a, mine. Yeah, and she's kept on stealing it. She would wait until uh Ratsy went to like take a nap and she would sneak mm -hmm. over there and she would bring it back. And then finally Grace was like, Wendy, just let her have it. Rat doesn't play with it. I was like, she needs to learn. <laughs> she ended up taking home the bunny, and we recently just finally put the bunny to rest because it had no ears mm -hmm. left or any legs. So it was just like a, just a, this. It was just a lump body, and I was like, "It's it's done." Yeah, there's a uh, there, there's a toy that Molly inherited from her friend uh, Blanche, uh, my friend Eliza's dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blanche, who passed away uh, last year, we had a we just had like a little kind of uh, I guess wake for the dog. Where Eliza just had a bunch of her, you know friends come over and just you know hang out and make her feel better. And there was like a corner where any fellow dog owner could just like you know take stuff that that was Blanche's and and I took this. I, I can't. Where'd you put it? It's over there. The, uh, the it, it's this wolf. <laughs> And and Eliza called it the faceless wolf because I think Blanche had like gotten both eyes out. And so now Molly plays with the faceless wolf. And so it's just a very like Star Wars Game of Thrones, one generation passing the torch to the next one kind of thing. So it's uh that's that's her face where you have like 15 minutes before it's feeding time. So hopefully we can stretch it into an hour. She's she's gonna be like, please. She's like, Daddy, please. I want my food. Well, whatever Molly wants. If, if Molly needs a break, then we'll take a break for Molly. <laughs> But speaking Good. of Molly and you, um, it's funny that you showed her Jaws because we know it's its 45th anniversary. Can you believe that? It's 45 years. 45 years of Jaws. Well, what is your like earliest memory of the first time watching Jaws? 
it always reminds me of my uncle. Um, I have an uncle, Paul, who owns a record store in York, Pennsylvania. If you're in the area, go swing by Ico's. Um, I think they're open. They socially distant protocols, but go go to Ico's. Iko is the record store. And my uncle was like just like the big cinephile in the in the family um, growing up. And so he was from my mom's side, and he. Um, when he would always like show us movies and stuff like that. Like he was the guy that had the laser discs, you know, like everybody oh, knew yeah. somebody that had a laser disc player and there were these giant discs that looked like an LP and you, and, but they were like giant CDs and you had to like flip them over every 30 minutes. And so like <laughs> jaw is like three discs long and he showed it to us. And my grandma had a pool in New Jersey in, in her backyard and so we like anytime we went swimming, Paul was known as the pool shark. And so he kind of initiated us to like how it actually is to be in the water with a shark chasing you. And then at night during the summer when we were visiting my grandma, we'd watch Jaws and it, it just got into my veins so early on in a good and a bad way. Because like if you go swimming in my grandma's pool and you're in the deep end by yourself and nobody else is in the pool, you start thinking about the music and you start getting nervous and you start, it's, it's an eight foot deep pool in the deep oh, wow. end. Like there's, you can look down, there's nothing in there, but when you're there by yourself and you're a kid or an adult, mm -hmm. you start thinking what the hell is under this water. Yep. No, anytime that, yeah, I was in a public, in a pool or any kind of, you know, it's, I think it's that, you know, that 365 degree all around you, you now have to be aware of. 365. Kind of 360, <laughs> wait, what is it? 360, yeah. 360. It's, 360, it's a year, but 365 uh, well, days. Well, you know, the, the whole, like, you have to worry about everywhere around you. It's not just, like, front and back. All it's, like, degrees. up and down and left <laughs> everywhere, you know? Yeah. That you're just, like, there's something here. I just now have to pay attention to every little spot around me. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we've accomplished that Dustin only goes swimming on leap year is, yeah. is what his... <laughs> Preference, <laughs> but it never like it never stopped me from wanting to go in the water uh, when we went to the beach, like going in the, in the ocean. And I'm sure everybody has this experience that as soon as you walk into the water when you're at the beach, you you, you think about the music, like the John Williams score is in my head, and I just suck it up and go in because I love like riding the waves and like getting in there and like really swimming in the ocean so much that I just kind of suck it up. Luckily, I've never seen a shark uh, up close. Um, it gotten close to a couple dolphins one time Ooh. and that, that, that's what our parents made sure to teach us early on the difference between a shark fin and a dolphin fin a because like there were some dolphins getting pretty close. So the dolphin fin is a lot more curved than like the shark, which is like a straight fin. So if it's like a really curt and usually dolphins love showing off, so they're going to show you that they're a dolphin. They'll like jump out of the water and sharks are just like stealth bombers. They're not letting anybody see them until it's too late, but you know, with, with all the stuff with that movie that Peter Benchley, who wrote the novel that the movie's based on, even said he regretted doing it because of how it vilified the actual animal, Great White Sharks. And so when I watch Jaws now, I just have to separate myself from the fact that this movie probably caused a lot of people to go trophy hunting and, you know, kill yeah. these, these poor sharks. So it does have a darkness to its legacy. But just as the movie as a, as a storytelling masterpiece, as the movie that is literally the reason why we all get to see Star Wars and Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park and every summer movie to follow it. Jaws was the first blockbuster and should be revered as such. Yeah. yeah. Well, the vilification of um, sharks is also something that they kind of did in the Meg. Wendy's been reading the books. Oh my God. And she's so many sitting Meg's there books. and she's like, this is an amazing series because it really focuses on like the science, the, um, the way that this animal would naturally behave. And, but in the movie, it was just a giant monster shark. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of good for you. That summer popcorn flick. Yeah. But yeah, it just, makes everyone now want to go out and kill sharks. Well, good luck finding a megalodon because you're going to have to travel all the way to the Mariana Trench and deep dive all the way to the bottom. But the books are so much better than the movie. I was, I liked the movie for what it was, but I was kind of disappointed because I wanted to see more of what the book gave us, which was more of the science and human behavior when like the attack started with the Meg. And then it was more of just like Jason Statham fighting a shark, which is also great at the same time, but I wanted more of the book. I mean, it is Jason Statham, and at one point he does actually kick a shark. I think he, I think he does kick the shark, and it's like, well, all right, I'm, I'm getting my popcorns worth anyway. But if I was to rank like the shark movies, 
Jaws is obviously far and away number one. Yeah. And then if I was like gonna go for like the the cheesier side of shark movies, I don't even consider Sharknado like movies. So th those are something else. Um, <laughs> I would. It, it, it's a, it's a it's a triple threat for me between the Meg. Deep Blue Sea yes. and Jaws the Revenge are all on the same because Jaws the Revenge is Jaws 4 and it is so mind-numbingly stupid, but it just, it, it sucks me in every time because the shark, this great white has ESP and it knows that the Brodies have now traveled to, um, I think they went to Jamaica or the Bahamas to go vacation for Christmas. And so the damn shark swims in the waters it usually cannot survive in just to go murder the rest of the Brody family, and it is glorious. <laughs> well, so we good. now have great white sharks off the coast of California, which is kind yeah. of like, oh my gosh, we're you know, they're Isn't starting to get drone shots. For, it's too cold for them. The waters are changing. Oh, great. Yeah, no, they're 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 totally cool with the water um off the Pacific coast, um, it, a little north of Santa Monica, like around Malibu is where uh, they've occasionally been spotted. And I'll tell y'all, like, local news is still good for two reasons, car chases and sharks being spotted. And I will take a shark being spotted over a car chase because they'll have, like, the helicopter, and you just see this giant behemoth swimming around, and it is awesome. I, I, I can't move. I am frozen to the TV watching it. They yeah. are just, yeah, a magnificent creature. When you see some video of them, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is, it's like really seeing an ancient um, behemoth. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That is just this powerful creature that you're just like, I didn't even know creatures like this existed anymore. And it's just, uh, it's nature, raw nature and it's all its glory. Yeah, then you think about the Megalodon and, and you think about how big that baby was back in like the days of the dinosaurs, like because, yeah, there were big creatures roaming the earth, but the ones swimming in the water. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, this is why I no longer go to the, the beach. I've never had any sort of like run in with the shark. Also, by the way, welcome, everybody, to our shark talk. And also <laughs> we're going to use our intro voices because Molly is now uh, claim the couch. And, and she is now napping, so we're all going to respect and use our indoor voices. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Wendy, you, you've worked with me for long enough to know I do not have an inside voice, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> I think I think she's she's pretty content where she is, though. Mm -hmm. is yeah, head? yeah, is she's doing okay. It's what's that, that? That's her head right there. Oh, okay. I thought her head. Her was... head is off the edge of got the couch, it, it. Oh, not like God. buried underneath the pillow. Ooh, so there we go. Because there's a lot of times yeah. when like Falcor will kind of hide right behind one of the curtains. He does this. And yeah. we have like playing. He's just like, you. Yeah. Every now and again, he'll peek out. He's like, okay, I'm going to go back to sleep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, throughout the show, we're going to talk more like entertainment news slash movie topics. But you guys can also send in your questions in the chat for us or Ellis or for Molly. Um, if she's so inclined <laughs> to answer. So feel free to start doing that. And uh, let's go into one of the topics I'm kind of very curious to hear Mark's thoughts on. And that is with the whole AMC thing. And I'm sorry if you've already talked about it on other people's streams, but AMC said that they're going to reopen in July and that masks were not going to be required because they didn't want to be drawn into a political controversy. Then after the internet basically blasted them for that comment. And I think within like 24 hours, they kind of did a whole Uno reversal and they're like, so we are going to re require masks now. What are your thoughts on all of this? And do you feel comfortable going back to the theaters with masks on? Yeah, it's one of the few times that the internet has been used for good. You see, it can be used for good. It, it, it's it's made, like a hedgehog, right? I mean, right. And and AMC, it's like, yeah, we, we, we fixed the hedgehog's teeth and now we have masks required. But like, here's my honest question is that I really don't trust movie theaters to enforce their policy because they never have before. And that's not an indictment necessarily on a giant movie theater chain or the crappy one that I used to work for back in Williamsburg, Virginia. But it's like yeah. you, you're you paying people minimum wage and it's it is are they really going to enforce? Are they going to be standing in the theater watching people to see if they have masks on? Are you allowed to take your mask off to shovel popcorn in your face? Like, well, what is... What is going to be the role with this? So I think that it's like anything else. Like people can claim that they don't think that they don't they need masks anymore. And if you want to be a dummy on the wrong side of history, that's fine. But I think what AMC at least realizes, like, look, we have to give the facade of, hey, 
just make people try to feel a little more comfortable by demanding that they wear masks. Is it actually going to be enforced person to person? Probably not. But I think it's just a nice comfort for a lot of folks. And I think that they realize, hey, we're going to lose a lot more business if we say there's no masks needed versus if masks are required. Because, like, come on, people are going to take their masks off in the theater. I'd love for it to be enforced in the same way that I would love for their cell phone rules to be enforced, which they never are. So, I, yeah. Yeah. You know what they need to do? They just need to make a mask that has like a little opening <laughs> just so you can be like, you can open the mask and then put in your, shove in your popcorn and then you like, you can put the mask. But that's not sanitary either because like, what if like somebody's droplet is on your mask because that's what it's supposed to help do and then you're touching that and then you're touching your popcorn. Use one hand for the mask, one hand for the popcorn. I Zip, love shove. A zipper. zipper. Yeah, we can put a zipper shove. right there. I mean, my contraption idea was like, it, you just make a catch-all helmet that everybody has to wear in the theater. And so this helmet not only will be your facial protection, you can sanitize them in between viewings. It's, and then it, on top of the helmet is a lockbox where you have to put your cell phone. And so you cannot get into the lockbox until after the movie's over. And then maybe we can have like a straw going in underneath the mask that'll get your soda. And then we can have Dustin's zipper idea. Thanks for contributing to my contraption, Dustin. And we'll unzip it and you get your popcorn and then back in. So there's ways to do it with the Mark Ellis helmet method. I, I love it. Add that to your $20 home theater, please. <laughs> It, well, twenty dollars for most people, twenty five for our friend Dennis. Then, but um, and he has to pay another quarter every time he wants to use the bathroom. <laughs> it's a long running joke. If you don't get it, go back and watch the early days of movie talk. Oh my god, that was yeah, that was a long time ago, and I still I, I still haven't been officially invited to the Mark Ellis Home Theater. So uh, I, I will wait for my invitation in the mail. Thank you very it's, much. It's uh, uh, hey, you can ask Dustin how he wants to use his plus one. Um, you know. I, I didn't want to start a, I know it's the movie couple channel, not the movie couples fight channel, but look, to be honest, I think I would invite both y'all just to get Navi and Falcor over to my place to hang. They're plus ones. <laughs> that's, that's, so yeah, the invitation is going to go out to Falcor and Navi and each one of them right. is plus one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of, since we're talking about movies, let's go ahead and roll into the first question. This was submitted via email by Jack Robbins, who's also in the chat. And he writes, hey guys, my question for Mark Ellis is, what was his most anticipated? <laughs> what was his most anticipated movie of 2020? Wah, wah. And what was the best movie or movies of 2019? Ooh boy! Um, so my most anticipated movie of this year was I was really excited about uh, Kong versus Godzilla. That's yeah. a big one for me. Um, Top Gun Maverick was going to be a big deal for me. I, I think Tenet looks great. I'll go see anything Nolan does. Um, and other than that, there's like a couple documentaries I was really looking forward to. And, and like to honestly answer the question, The Last Dance was the, the entertainment piece I was most looking forward to this yeah. year. Because I've been waiting for it for two years once I heard that this was a thing that was going to come out. So getting to enjoy that, even if I had to push Top Gun and Kong versus Godzilla, it was worth it to get to see Michael Jordan talk about Michael Jordan for 10 episodes. It was fantastic. And I loved it. So for the like, like, that, that goes to the thing though. I, I think that if you're gonna go back to the theater, right? If AMC says you gotta wear a mask or you don't have to wear a mask or whatever they say, mm -hmm. it really is gonna boil down to everybody always has that threshold, right? Of like, okay, well, I want to see this movie, but do I want to pay fifteen dollars to go see it, and then add another ten for popcorn, another five for soda, parking, all that stuff? And I think that just with this new world we live in, that threshold went from here to here. And so there's certain movies that, yeah, I would still, I'll wear a mask and I'll be as, I mean, Wendy, you've been to a lot of movies with me. You know, I love sitting away from people anyway. And <laughs> yeah. so, um, unless it's Wendy that bought me popcorn, then I have to sit next to her, which I'll yeah. take. <laughs> I, I, I love sitting next, uh, away from people anyway. But for a movie like Tenet, for example, that is worth the risk to me to investigate going to see a theater. Now, if I walked in and it's a packed house and everybody's taking up a seat, I think I'd probably uh, just say peace. I'll, I'll try a different showing or I'll wait a couple of weeks. I just don't want to sit next to a stranger. But 
with Tenet, that's one of those ones where it's like, yeah, is this, gonna, is this worth it for me? If a new Star Wars movie came out, which Rise of Skywalker was one of my favorite movies last year, would it be worth it for me? So I think everybody just has to look at the actual art and then is that worth the risk? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm looking forward to, obviously, Wonder Woman 1984 is top of the list. Tenet. Um, I got lucky and I saw Mulan before before shit hit the fan, essentially. Um, so that was that was like Good. a real, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It definitely stands out. I think I'm still under embargo, technically, I guess. Um, so it still <laughs> has a lot of like all the moments that we love from from the animated, but they also added some different moments that makes it really unique and that can stand on its own. So you're not going to look at, say, if you didn't like The Lion King because it was basically like a cut and paste of the animated, that's not where you're going to get with Mulan. So I, I appreciated what they tried to do with it. And I, I really enjoyed it. I just, I felt like it could have been just a tit, a tit, tit bit longer, just a little bit longer. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just a little bit. It's really now you're going to have to pick and choose which ones yeah, are your priority, mm -hmm. which movies mm -hmm. are you like, no, no, I have to see this in the theater. Um, Tenet, you know, it's not just in the theater. I want to see that one in IMAX. I want to get that incredible sound that Nolan's going to be playing with. Yeah. And it's going to be one of those things that you're like, no, no, no. You really want the theater experience with this movie yeah so and yeah if something if there's movies that are coming out that i'm like you know being in the theater isn't going to enhance it that much then yeah i'm going to be like okay i'll wait for it to come out um um to um streaming yeah exactly yeah and look i mean i i you all know how i roll so if i really want to see tenet which i do and i'm looking at like the amac the the amax <laughs> the amex the uh the theater that's at uh city walk you know like that big imax theater yeah. I might buy myself six tickets and just I'm going to buy them in a row. And if like my friends, Wendy and Dustin and their dogs want to come, then they can. And y'all can be my human shields because I paid for the ticket. But <laughs> I, I like I can I will make the investment because I'm very fortunate that I have a little bit of money to play with it. I can make the investment in my health and my comfort by just buying more tickets and just having empty seats next to me. So I might go to that. I would certainly go to that level for Star Wars um for uh probably top gun maverick for congress versus godzilla for stuff like that that i just i really want that like what dustin said that theatrical experience that's actually such a good idea i actually haven't thought that way but i just would buy more tickets i would 100 percent <laughs> drop some money so i can like kind of create my own little social distance bubble around me mm -hmm. and just be like no mm -hmm. my bubble tickets can't sit there <laughs> the thing I is my though, ticket. you yeah. still have i mean you're still gonna have like you'd have to like buy out the entire row because if you're sitting somewhere and someone's like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom, they're still got to like <laughs> cross by you. And it's always in the theater. Excuse me. Pardon me. Sorry. You know, either butt or crotch that's in your face. All so right. I'll it's buy like, like the furthest back and the furthest in the corner. So you're like, no yeah. one's walking by me. I'm yeah. buying, I'm buying the corner and then I'm going to buy all the way in the back. And here's what I'll do. I will buy everybody in the theater a catheter too. So they don't have to, <laughs> have to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll never forget that I didn't want to get up at the premiere for, was it Endgame? That was like the longest Avengers game, uh, mm -hmm. Avengers, Avengers movie. And so I stopped drinking liquids from that morning of, and I didn't consume liquid until the after party. So I wouldn't have to be that one, one person that got up. That's kind of like, she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She had to get up. No, she wasn't But ready. I do remember one, <laughs> I do remember one person who had to get up during the premiere and he happened to be like close to the middle. It was not you. It was not you because I think you sat like this side of me and this person was like that side of me and they had to be like sorry excuse me sorry excuse me sorry excuse me and walk through and i was like yep and they always hit you twice because they got to come back sorry excuse me sorry excuse me <laughs> i have been that person and 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 at those premieres they really box you in sometimes and so there's just nothing to do like my trick here's my little bathroom trick to go see a movie that's like two two and a half hours is i will relieve myself before the movie right and I go out and I don't go back to my seat because if I'm sitting somewhere in the middle, then I don't want to make everybody get up. And so what I do is I just kind of mill around and I try to time it. And so I'll mill around for like five minutes and then I'll go right back to the bathroom and I force out whatever else I need to force out. And then I go sit down. That's the key. And That's if, if, you're gonna, if you get a free soda, just sip it. Don't chug it right away. That's my inclination is always chug. I will chug anything in front of me 
and I try not to do it with soda at a premiere like Avengers Endgame because it was like the stadium set up and, yeah. and it was just very tough to get to the bathroom. And I knew it was going to be once the movie started and I knew it was going to be a long movie. So I made sure that that bladder was totally empty before <laughs> the movie started. We, we won. We didn't, none of us got up until after the premiere. And then there was like the longest line for the bathroom because mm -hmm. everybody, nobody went for the food or the bar. They're like, no, no, we got to take care of business first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also have a couple of super chats from Woo! Vanja and another person, but let's go ahead and get Vanja's first because thank yeah. you so much for the support. Woo! Vanja, yay. Mark your thoughts on last year's Terminator, Joker, and Zombieland double tap. Miss you, dude. Been with AMC slash Collider since 2014. Whoa, that's when I started. Yeah, it was uh, fun times back then, and getting to host the show for a while was a lot of fun. And yeah. since I left that show, and I mean, I still obviously am a big movie fan, and I just don't review movies that much anymore, um, which is just nice because you know I, I have other interests that I get to fulfill and still hang out with all my movie you know YouTube buddies. But um, with, as far, I never saw Terminator, so I still have not seen Terminator. And Dark fate, I, right? yeah, Dark Fate. Yeah, I do want to see it. I, I think that I, I've heard enough positive things to like get me to invest the time because I'm such a massive Terminator 2 fan that something that picks up from there. I'm like, yeah, I'm on board for, especially after the last few we've gotten. So mm -hmm. with uh, Zombieland Double Tap, I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was it was just a really fun, rollicking adventure. It was everything that I wanted from Zombieland and those folks. And then with um, Joker, you know, I I saw it once and I didn't see it again and I didn't feel compelled to see it again. I think from a movie making standpoint, it's just fantastic what what Todd Phillips was able to do and Joaquin Phoenix was able to pull off. And the some of the shots in that are just so well done. So from a movie making standpoint, it was great. But there's just so much emotional unpacking to do that everybody has to do after you see that movie. So, you know, it, 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 the the authenticity of the comedy club was something that impressed me. Now, no, no New York comedy club or Gotham comedy club is ever going to have actually lit candles at every table because that's just not safe. <laughs> but, um, the, the feeling of watching someone go up uh, who's never done stand up before and seeing how they, they're getting some sympathy laughs at the beginning or they're so weird or Andy Kaufman like and then watching it devolve into what that set was. It felt very authentic to an actual uh, comedy club open mic, which I've both been the person in the crowd, in the yeah. back or on stage. I've experienced it all. And so that was very similar. And so us comics have to remind ourselves every day not to go down the Joker path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that movie really impacted me. And I like I like what you said about how it's a difficult watch because there's a lot to unpack there. It's not mm -hmm. just like the mental health stuff. There's so much more about, about like human behavior and society and whatnot. I remember seeing the movie together because I missed it at TIFF. I was flying back from TIFF when they premiered it because I didn't you don't know the schedule when you book the tickets. And I was like, well, I can either try to change my ticket and fly back the next day, but I didn't have any more like clean clothes left and I was like I guess I'll just take the L on this one and, and I went home so we saw it together and after the movie I think we stayed in our seats for like 10 minutes because I couldn't move and I was like sobbing I put my little mm -hmm. little hoodie over my head and I just like sobbed it out because I I I couldn't even explain the emotions I was feeling but that was a really impactful movie I would like to revisit it again but maybe Maybe not right now. Yeah, it's like, it really was one of those movies that was kind of like Schindler's List to where it's beautifully done, but you're just a wreck afterwards. And, you know, just all of the emotional upheaval that has gone inside you, watching this character just being torn apart kind of a thing and how he's changing and how all of these things that are just, you know, there are all these safety nets that could have been there that just nothing caught him. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just one of those things that you're just sitting there and you're just like, it's so beautifully done, but it just affects you so much that you're like, yeah, you I just... did it once and I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't have to watch Schindler's List again. I don't have to watch Joker again. It had this effect on me and now I can move on with mm -hmm. my life. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's that weird thing where like I, I watched movies. Most of the time I watched movies either to be um, uplifted or to be educated. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Joker wasn't really going to do either one of those things. Um, for me that it was just going to, it was going to be an emotional experience. And I like having my emotions moved sometimes 
to that point. Like I like getting into a heavy drama every so often, but more often than not, it would be like if I like this Super Bowl up there, yeah. that's that's one that we won. And so I watched that game all the time. The next year, Washington went back to the Super Bowl and got their ass kicked by the Raiders. I have never put that game on. And it was a beautifully played game by the Raiders, but I ain't sitting through that because it's just three hours of, of just depressing. How could we let this happen? And so that's off the docket for me. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. Why Star Wars is when you, um, what is it? Re Return of the Jedi is your favorite out of the three because we win. We won. <laughs> we won. What happened? We did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what we want. We want that victory. We want that stand up and yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of moments. <laughs> well, Vanja, thank you so much for the super chat and how it started a very impactful conversation. And we also have two super chats. Or I think they're comments from Flash18487 who writes, I'll wait a couple of weeks, then pick an early morning weekday showing when no one's there talking about going to mm -hmm. theaters and when that's a good time to do it. I probably would do that too. Like matinee Tuesday, if you don't want... Like it's similar to Ella's, like I don't really enjoy being around a mass of people in the theater, like because just people chit chat, and I'm just kind of like hush, trying yeah. to watch a movie, put your phone away. Like I'm so bothered by people like that, so I would sometimes book a very early morning ticket because I know I can almost have the, the theater to myself. Yeah, and it's also there are some movies that you kind of want the whole crowd there, but you know, mainly they're better like at the premiere or at the very first showing, like the midnight showing of, well, they're not midnight showings anymore because they show them now. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Yeah. But yeah, it's the other times that you want that huge crowd is when it's like a big blockbuster movie. Like when seeing Avengers, the first Avengers with a huge crowd was just awesome because those moments where everyone just stands up and you're like, yeah. <laughs> And those are the moments that you want that huge crowd. Other times, I'm perfectly fine with like one or two other people in the mm -hmm. theater and that's it. Yeah, yeah. So hit those matinees early morning. Yeah. It, showing it, the movie. it really works for me the best with a, with a comedy. It, like, because I, I feel like these, these Thursday midnight showings have aged alongside me because like it started out, you had to go to midnight. And then as I got older and wanted to go to bed earlier, the movie times on Thursday got... <laughs> <laughs> earlier too so they let old farts like me now get to go see like the 7 p.m show instead of the midnight show but we have to do that now because like in social media especially for like a big event movie where you know there's going to be spoilers you got to get in there like not only not even friday you got to get in there sometime thursday or just ditch your phone for a day with comedies there's nothing really that you're going to spoil like even like a laugh like it, you're not really going to spoil that so having a great laugh in a packed house especially something that like you're watching one of your favorite comedy actors it's mm -hmm. it's it's a special feeling and so that's that's the kind of stuff that you miss but again i i'm spoiled because i get to be around it in a different capacity and so i don't miss it as much as you know some other folks might yeah, that makes sense. And for sure. always seeing those movies that are just they have joke after joke after joke that you miss certain lines because everyone's laughing so hard. And the previous joke, you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> right, so right. Your breath again, and then you have to go back and watch it again because you missed all of it. That happened to me at one of Ellis's show where he told a joke I hadn't heard yet. And I like busted up laughing so hard that I missed the the next punchline and that was kind of I didn't want to be that person that's like what did he just say because I missed the joke not that I didn't understand I literally was laughing too hard at myself and I didn't hear it so um I think I caught it at the next one like a little while later hey uh the, you know every comic has their own um you know kind of weird picadillos on stage so I'll make sure next time you're at a show Wendy I'm gonna go a little slower just <laughs> after I get that laugh I want you to hear everything you're you're my target audience so I want you to hear everything Dustin, actually, can I tell him? What? I don't know. We were talking about the possibly having of, of having you on the show, and you're kind of like, yeah, flossing and flying. <laughs> I was I was thinking of like saying that you're like, hey, how's it going? Flossing and flying. Oh, I <laughs> love it, man. I was so many of those little clips, and I, every time I'm scrolling through Instagram, I'm always like, oh, another clip, and I always want to watch. And one of the ones that you recently did, or that I recently remember you putting up. Was the one where you're talking about you did the um, uh, C oh what are the what is what is it, what is it called when you go do the oh uh, the USO show USO I was like yeah so right right and I just I thought that was a hilarious joke oh thank you and unfortunately it's it's all true I really act like that much of a moron in front of our nation's military 
<laughs> well, they're, I got to admit, these guys are got to be intimidating, you know, when you're oh, yeah. on their turf and you're in their world and you have these big tanks, guns, jets, bombs yeah, yeah. that you got to sign. <laughs> Just landed an F-18 and like I get nervous saying thank you to pilots who fly me commercially from place to place. You know, like well, when the cockpit's open and you're deep planning and you see the pilot, you're like, ah, yeah, thank you. And like <laughs> I get excited about that. So you put me with a with a guy who flies a jet, I'm 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 lost for words. Yeah. I've had the same, same like kind of like I stumble. It's kind of like just say thank you. You're like, have a have a nice flight. You too. Wait, no. <laughs> Wait, you're flying. I'm not. I'm just sitting. Okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs> the YouTube problem. Yeah. The YouTube you too. Problem. Wait, if you ever fly, you know. Someday. Just, someday. I'll never mm -hmm. fly. I'm blind as a bat. I, I can never be a pilot ever. <laughs> we also have another super chat comment from same uh, user Flash18487 who writes, Dr. Sleep was the best movie of last year, period. Did you get to see it? I did. And Dr. Sleep might crack my top 10. I don't know if I ever did a top 10 list from last year, but if I did, Dr. Sleep would be somewhere in the mix. Maybe honorable mention, maybe not quite top 10, but I thought Dr. Sleep was great. I loved how it tied into the original Shining without feeling like it had to hit you over the head with, hey, remember, we're, we're part of the Shining universe. Like it did its own thing. And I think if anything, that title sunk the movie at the box office. It's a cool title and I get it, but I just think that mass audiences were not aware enough that this is a sequel to one of the greatest horror films we've ever seen. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm still trying to convince Dustin to watch it with me. I'm not a big it's, horror it's, fan. I don't think it's, it's not like one of those scary. Kind of yeah, it's not. It doesn't really have many jump scares, if any. I don't, really don't remember. It wasn't. I was trying to explain. It's not like a quiet place where you have a mass of just anxiety while watching the film. Like this one, it's just kind of like more of a psychological thriller than anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 like an it's like a suspense action thrill ride where it's it, you know you're following the good and the bad and you're waiting for them to kind of you know meet and at the end will get a little bit of horror in there because it is The Shining and, and it, that is the source material and it was written by Stephen King but I don't think it's if you can get through The Shining then you can get through Doctor Sleep. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I could get through The Shining. Really? I thought you've seen it. <laughs> no, I've, I've seen bits. Of, I've seen bits oh, no. and pieces of it and I'm like, okay, that's good. I'm, I'm hey, gonna... it's a tough movie for me to revisit too because I stay in a lot of hotels and like I've done that walk where like you get home at, at certain hotels from the show from the late show like two a.m. and you're in the hallway by yourself and you're like, oh my god, am I am I hearing a ghost bartender right now? Is there going to be some old lady in my bathtub? It's um, it, it's it's a nerve wracking experience. Yeah, I t I totally agree. I have those same moments when I like in a hotel and kind of like just run to your door and hopefully the card key works on the first try and you just get in. And then the yeah. anxiety, turn all the lights on. The anxiety you feel when it doesn't work and it doesn't work and you don't you're like no no it's and it then you're like wrong one, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, next one over. <laughs> um, we have a question from Flash for Ellis who writes, "What new name would Ellis like to pick for his Washington Redskins?" Uh, literally anything. Literally. <laughs> Just get rid of, and uh, you know, if, if you're going to do a wash of the name, which should have been done a long time ago, but if you're going to expunge that, I think that you also like, I wouldn't, don't meet me halfway with this, you know, don't call them the, the Washington, um, you know, chiefs for lack of a better word or, or tribe or something like that. Like it's just that logo is right up there with the name for me. Um, I know it was intended as, as something that was, to be prideful of Native Americans, and I can respect the effort, but that's as far as I'm going. And I think that it's beyond time to change the name. So change it to Tony Kornheiser, who hosts a show on ESPN called uh, Part of the Interruption, had a great call. And he said, you should change it to the Washington Warriors. And the reason is because when you have warrior, you still you know, can symbolize uh, culture a little bit, but more importantly, the Wounded Warriors Project was founded at Walter Reed Hospital in D.C., and so it makes all the sense in the world, and there's so many community ties you could have with that, so Washington Warriors would be great, Washington Senators would be great, because there used to be a baseball team called the Washington Senators that were in the majors, and then they moved, and they changed their name, and now we have the Washington Nationals, so just call the Redskins the Senators, and we're good. We're back. I like the senators because it also reminds me of Star Wars. Yes. Yeah. 
But you could literally call him anything. I mean, you could call him the Washington Babu Fricks for all I care. Just, <laughs> just change the name. That would make a know? great mascot, though. Imagine that. A mm-hmm. Babu Frick? A giant Babu Frick with a giant Babu Frick head? That would be epic. That would be terrifying. I think that would be hilarious. Yeah, because then you have your mascot out there ah, <laughs> dancing yeah. around going, hey! Ah. hey. <laughs> <laughs> <It's over. laughs> um, our, uh, our viewer, AMR Nail, writes... Hey, Mark, you said uh, Star Wars Rise of Skywalker was your favorite movie last year. So what do you expect from the next Star Wars movie? I have no idea, I, I, it, which is fun to walk into a Star Wars movie and not have that set of expectations as far as like, oh, how are they going to continue the Skywalkers? What are we going to see from the past? It, it, how are we going to pretend to the future? With this new one, I, I think that the next series is going to be set what four or five hundred years before the skywalkers came about before anakin made c-3po and started pod racing so i think that anything is on the table it would be nice to have yeah i I am all on board for for yoda a younger yoda with like a you know like a middle age yoda like a midlife crisis yoda yoda driving around like a like a mazda miata would be great um and you could have Maz Kanata. We could go visit her bar, but tell a new story with new characters. And I, I'm, I'm happy that I have no expectations for what the next Star Wars movie series is going to be. I'm just, I'm excited to be there. Yeah, and it's actually that's a unique feeling. We haven't had that in mm-hmm. any of the six other movies that we got since Return of the Jedi. Is that we've always had these expectations? Oh, we get to see Anakin. We get to see. Um, how he evolved. Oh, we now get to see what happened to Luke after Return of the Jedi and all of these expectations. And now going 400 years into the past, you don't even know what characters are actually going to be there besides maybe Yoda. He's yeah. the only one that's old enough. Maybe, oh no, this is 400 years. Chewie was like, is 300 and something years old, right? Uh, che- Chewie's about 200. So he's, he, I mean, you yeah. might get to see uh, Chewie's daddy and Chewie's daddy can redeem himself for his performance in the holiday special. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but that's also the challenge yeah. with with Lucasfilm. I think that, that that's what the challenge is. I think that's probably why they were hesitant for so long to make a new series of movies that are in a totally different time and space in the same galaxy, because every Star Wars movie that has been released, they have a hook. You know, I mean, it was very easy with these last three. It was The Force Awakens. It's like, oh, we got the gang back together. And then. The Last Jedi, we were like, oh, we get to see Luke. Finally, we get to see Luke and what he's really been up to. And then Rise of Skywalker, we get to finish this epic thing. And the Emperor was laughing, so the Emperor's back. Like, there were always these old characters to get us back in. And I think that the that, that J.J. and Ryan did a great job of utilizing them and not wasting them, but also giving us new characters to root for at the core of the story. I think that was a very tough balance to strike. I don't think that they get either one gets enough credit for that. Yeah. No, that's totally true. Agree. I'm also excited to see if they ever start to go, what's going on in the galaxy after Ray? So after yeah. um, the rise of Skywalker, maybe go a hundred years into the future there. Because now you don't have, after Ray, you really don't have any kind of, no dark side or light side has any stronghold anywhere. The Republic's gone, the First Order's gone. Um, so what is Ray going to build with it? kind of a yeah. thing. So I'm I would be really eager to kind of see this new no Jedi's around, no Sith Lords around. How does the force now create a galaxy or how is the force influencing the galaxy when there's none of these superpowers kind of pushing the narrative? Agreed. It's it's an interesting thing because if, if we see a movie like when we saw the prequels obviously, we knew what was about to happen. And so even if we see a movie 400 years or a thousand years or whatever before the events of the classic trilogy, we still know where it's going eventually. But yeah. when you talk about the future, we have no effing idea. And so I, I think that that makes them nervous too, though. I think that that's one of those ones where like they need to get everybody who's a creative of Lucasfilm and really hammer out where do we want to go with the future? Because yeah. they, they have somewhat of a roadmap that they can follow even with events of like the old Republic and when the Jedi had just become the guardians of peace in the galaxy, there's some sort of roadmap they can follow with the future. We have no idea. And I think it scares the hell out of them. And I get excited about it. 
me me too like you guys basically said a lot of what i was feeling is i am i i love that we got this kind of like full well round well rounded you know story that ended the skywalker saga essentially and now i'm ready for new characters new stories not saying that i'm tired of you know all these existing characters because that's where my love from star wars was born to begin with but right it's a huge universe it's so expansive and i think like you know and and if people want to continue on with that storyline, I don't know, maybe give me like a broom kid origin story or something like that. It's <laughs> well, one of those things where it, it's just more exciting to talk about Star Wars for me than than any other movie franchise for these kind of reasons. But then also like, like, like Wendy, you make a great point about these characters that we fell in love with are the reason why a lot of us kept going back to see Star Wars. And in my experience, I was rewarded for it because I love the movies, but I think that people have to wrap their heads around the possibility that you're going to go see a new Star Wars movie and it might be great, but it's not going to affect you emotionally the same way that seeing Luke or Han or Leia did because you did not grow up with these people. And so you have to kind of let go of that. You know, that, that, that's what one of the themes of the new trilogy is. You, sometimes you just got to let the past die a little bit. You know, you can remember it, but let, hey, look at what we're doing in our country right now. There's some past that we're letting die for good reason. And yeah. this could be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> not the play itself, not John Reagan's on fourth and one, just the name should be a thing of the past. <laughs> and I think they're doing a great job with balancing that in um, mm -hmm. Mandalorian, being able to have laughing. just this right amount of connection to the past with this new outlook on going in a direction that they've never done before. And I just love what Dave Filoni and John Favreau are doing with that series. So I'm hoping that once they kind of wrap this up, they will be able to also move on to kind of helm a big movie. Yeah. With yeah. I, I feel like we're all dining at a, at a nice restaurant and the Mandalorian is, is the delicious uh, tapas that they bring to the table. And it's just, it's a nice plate and it's meant for sharing and it, it, it can be a meal, but we all know as Star Wars fans, oh, this is an appetizer because there's a big steak and it might be coming in two years, might be coming in four years. I don't know, but it's it's getting here eventually. Yeah, it's going to be really, really fantastic. I can't wait. I love Star Wars. So just keep giving us all the stories and we will gladly hand over our money plus whatever I spend on merchandise, which is way too much. <laughs> and wear masks. We will gladly wear masks. Wear, masks. wear your Star Wars masks. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And we have another super chat from uh, Haskell420. Thank you so much. Hey. Hey, gang. As a lifelong uh, and huge Godzilla fan, I am concerned. Do you think they're going to kill Godzilla to make Kong officially King Kong? I pray not. That's well, Ed. Uh, Eddie and I have had this uh, this friendly conversation debate in person, too, because he knows I'm a King Kong honk, okay? I root for Kong. Kong is my guy, and so I'm rooting for Kong to take down Godzilla. Now, I really like Godzilla in these new iterations. I've always been a Godzilla fan. I just root for Kong. Over, you, you know, I, I love basketball, but you got to pick a team to root for. So I don't. I, I think what's going to end up happening in this movie, and maybe it's, it's not the most – creative or bold choice to make. I think that Godzilla and Kong are going to meet up. They're going to fight. It's going to be a great fight. And then there's going to be other monsters that Godzilla and King Kong have to kind of team up against. So they'll fight them. And then it's going to be like a Rocky and Apollo relationship where they'll spar with each other from time to time to stay in shape. But they know there's other enemies out there that they got to go take care of. So who is the Ivan Drago monster that is going to be yeah. going up against both Kong and Godzilla that's the question we got to be asking ourselves, Eddie. That is a beautiful analogy. I mean, to compare that to, um, to Rocky is the fact that you have these two characters that you now love, but they're supposed to fight and kill one another. How do you deal with that? And I was kind of like, when I was looking at the question, I'm kind of like, I'm pretty sure they're not going to kill one or the other. So mm -hmm. there has to be some kind of either... Um, he wins, but the other person doesn't, the other character doesn't die. Like swim away or walk away in defeat. Yeah. Sort of a thing, walking to the sunset. But the fact that they'd be working together on something, I think, is an excellent idea and probably if, the, more dire the, the direction that they're going to go. Yeah. If I had one page of one script that is currently in development that I could read, it would be, you know, just it's, it's, if I just get this manila envelope delivered to my door and I open it up and it's like page 
108 or whatever page we find out what happens on it, that's the page that I want to read. I, I'm excited about all these movies. I need to see, is there a clear cut winner? Because they could do that, that Freddy versus Jason thing where Freddy versus Jason in that movie, Jason gets credit for the win. Okay. In my book, Jason gets credit for the W but he's holding Freddie's head and then Freddie winks and it's like, uh, did he really win? So Jason gets the W, but Freddie's still around. Agreed. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want either to die. I think emotionally I'm too attached to both watching them both growing up. So mm -hmm. I, I think there should be a third component or it could just be like the humans. They just gang up and like fight the humans as we, yeah, Godzilla we, we King kill Kong the earth. Like yeah, Godzilla and King Kong are like, you know who's the real bad guy? These little people that are just destroying our planet. You know what? Yep. Let's come up and take them out. Yeah. And that right. ends, all, there's no humans, and Godzilla and King Kong are like, hey, you know what? Let's let's go get let's go hang out. Let's you know, go get a coffee. <laughs> let's go get a coffee. Crack open a beer. A giant. Of course, like. <laughs> Jonathan Dawson, uh, Don Sal wants to know which is our favorite Natalie Portman movie. Ooh. Ooh she's, done a that's a, she's done a lot. I, mean, I liked her in V for Vendetta. V for Vendetta is great. That was a really good movie. Closer is good. Mm hmm. The, I mean, heck, the very, one of the very first ones we see her in The Professional. Yeah. yeah. Professional is where I was leaning. I also really, really liked Annihilation. I thought she was great in that. Ooh, yes. So. And I'll give, you know, I, I, obviously I'm a, I am know the prequels have their, their problems, but I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. I, I don't necessarily think it's her best performance by any stretch of the imagination, but she was there. She gave it a game effort. So I'll, I'll say that yep. she was so good in Black Swan, but Black Swan is another one of those movies where it's like, do I feel like emotionally doing that to myself tonight? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I remember coming out of that movie and you're just like, what? Yeah. what just happened? What just happened? <laughs> what did I just watch? But yeah, I mean, also with the prequels, she did an amazing job with what she was given, kind of a thing. Did you ever see? There was a um, behind the scenes clip of for Attack of the Clones when she's trying to go through the droid mm -hmm. factory, and um, it's all of these blue foam kind of um, like stompers that she's trying to pass through, and she's going, "This is the most ridiculous thing I have." ever done and george is of course is like oh don't don't worry um, it will look great in post <laughs> and she's just like okay yeah she did her job as, as the actress being hired to do you know and, and i thought and i thought she looked great in it so a lot of the lines didn't work but she didn't write them yeah you know she just had to deliver it and sometimes even then the director can say i want you to de deliver it this way because they have a vision so she i would say she did her job and i hate that anybody wants to get get like mad at an actor yeah. for their performances and i'm kind of like you forget about the editors and the directors and the writers there's so many people that are involved in making a movie this time you know you do it better and faster <laughs> she's yeah. great though i'll, I'll show up to see an natalie portman movie I, I think she's she's loaded with talent and jackie she was great in jackie so good oh yeah so good and uh flash wants to test our movie knowledge who writes guess the movie quote I don't know. Oh, sorry. I know I don't look old, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart. I need a holiday, a very long holiday, Aww. and I don't expect to. I okay. Remember. Okay. I think I have it. I think I have it. And I think I have the reason for this quote. So the, I know I don't look old, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart. Um, and then I don't expect I shall return. Uh, we don't always talk like that in modern era and maybe necessarily humans. That sounds more like the language of a hobbit, perhaps. So I'm thinking it is, I'm going to say that it's, it's said by uh, Ian Holm, the great actor we just lost, who played Bilbo Baggins. Mm -hmm. And th the movie that he says it in, oh man, I... Um, I'm gonna go with the end of the Battle of the Five Armies is my guess. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. No, if I it's... think it's at the very beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. I think it's at the end of the Fellowship. Oh no! You know what? I'm gonna say end of Return of the King. Oh. Right. Oh. Because he freaks out in Fellowship. He freaks out like tries to bite the damn ring off of Frodo's finger when he sees it. Yeah. So. I don't know when he says that, but Flash, we you don't have to pay us more money. You can if you want to. We got to get the answer. We, we, we need this, Flash. Somebody in the chat has to know, 
Okay. I'm seeing a lot of Fellowship of the Ring. I think I'm seeing Fellowship as well. Yeah, I think it's when he's talking to Gandalf, saying, you know, that he he's this is right before Aww. he has his party he slips on mm-hmm. the ring and he vanishes and that was his idea of going on a permanent holiday uh, I think. and he okay. says and that's when he was like i i probably what is it I, a very long holiday and i don't expect that i shall return so that is when he's planning to leave hobbiton forever he yeah plan to come back to the shire he plans to go off on his he wants to do another exploring and but then he goes to rivendell and then that's when, since he doesn't have the ring, all of his age hits him. Ah, so it's it, it's very field of dreams, you know. Yeah. Like you, you could be on the playing field and you're young, and then you step off that playing field, and it's it's how I felt this morning stepping off of the track. I felt fine when I was running, and then as soon as I was done running, I was like, "Oh my god, what am I? I'm like reverse Benjamin Button. What? Oh, jeez, <laughs> everything's freaking." <laughs> Every time everybody, anybody says Benjamin Button, I just think of Schnapp. Meh, meh, meh. <laughs> Whenever we talk about that, that was my favorite, one of my favorite movie talk moments when we talk about uh, Benjamin Button, like yeah. the teaching process. Meh, with a little little tiny Brad Pitt. Um, thank you guys all so much for all of your questions today. Uh, I know we're coming towards the end of it. I know Dustin has a really important question that he would like to mark to to ask Mark Ellis. Wait, I do. Yeah, this what? one. Was it the, um, oh, that's right. Um, because one of the things that you have been posting on your Instagram is your um, Wii Golf Tournament. Yes. That you've been doing. So how's how's the golf tournament going? Okay, first of all, I love this little insight into the movie couple workings because we clearly see who the dominant hand is in this relationship. <laughs> and he's like, hey, didn't you have something you want to ask? You're asking this question. Ask it right now. Ask it right now. <laughs> Wendy, thank you for doing a great job with our Dustin. We love our Dustin and he needs guidance and you're the perfect person to give it to. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I do appreciate the uh, the question, uh, Dustin. In um, I am doing great in Wii Golf. I, I had a couple tough rounds this morning because the wind was just gusting all over the place. So when I play Wii Golf, um, I use one of two me's that I created. One is David Lee Roth and one is Sammy Hagar, both former lead singers of Van Halen. And so they're just constantly battling each other. And Sammy Hagar had a tough round. He really had to deal with the brunt of the wind. So he shot a five under. And then David Lee Roth, what did Roth shoot? I think Roth shot a eight under. Roth shot an eight under. Yeah. And this is over nine holes. So, you know, eight under on nine holes is, is pretty impressive. I have shot 12 under on the nine hole course, which is birding every par three and par four and eagling every par five. I've only done it once with David Lee Roth and it's never happened again. Wow. Yeah. So, that one good day, but and I was on, I had, I was, you know, everything was working in my favor. I feel like you're asking me this because maybe you have a Wii. We have a Wii, but I've never played Wii golf though. Okay. Y'all get in the gym in real life to be good at Wii Golf because I'm terrible. I can't hit the ball. The ball's no. not moving, so it's just laying there and I swing and I miss every time and then it's just, I give up. No, as a matter of fact, much to Josh Bakuga's chagrin, um, I prefer Wii Golf over regular. I haven't played real golf. I used to play a lot. I haven't played in like 10 years because, you know, life and it's, it's just hard to get to courses in LA. Traffic sucks. And this is right here. And after the initial investment, it's free all day. All night, green speeds, it's perfect. And the swing that you do with this controller is different than a golf swing. And so if you're not good at golf, you have no designs to play golf, that's actually the target demographic for Wii Golf. Because if you're playing real golf and Wii Golf, it's probably going to mess your real swing up. So uh, pick one or the other, and I think that you guys are going down the right path with the Wii Golf. Have you re- accidentally wrecked your TV by having the controller fly out of your hands? Not this TV. Um <laughs> My mom's TV at home might have some other things to say, but not my beautiful new 75 inch TV. So I'm trying to keep that pristine as possible. So I do aim. So when I do my swing, I make sure that if I do lose control, it's going to hit the wall and not the TV. Wow. I like the the wrist, the wrist strap that comes with the thing. Mm -hmm. So, cause I have playing before (laughs) the 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 remote, the remote went, we, and I was like, oh no, but it didn't hit anything. We're okay. 
Yeah, yeah. You, you use the wrist wrap for safety. It's not as important as, you know, say wearing a mask outside, but it, it helps. <laughs> Agreed. Well, Ellis, uh, I know we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us. And thank you, Molly, for, um, you know, Taking just being present. She showed you. She's like, you want little. To uh -huh. See, so everybody thinks that she's lazy because every time she's on camera, she's just kind of lounging and relaxing. But what they don't see is that the wizard behind the curtain, me, takes her for a long walk. Like we, we sometimes we'll go an hour, hour and a half if it's not too hot outside, just because she loves getting to walk all around the neighborhood and getting her smells in and meeting other dogs and friends. And then when she gets back, she's super exhausted. And then it's time to do the show. And so she takes a little nap. This is me. If you've ever seen me do stand up, this is me two hours before that moment. I take oh, a nap, wow. I relax, and then I wake up and I do the show. But this is what I look like 5 p.m. every night before the show starts at 8 p.m. Isn't that right? Sweetie? Molly's going to be ready to go in about in about 20 minutes. She's going to be like, all right, dad, I'm up. Let's do stuff. Oh, she's such a little sweetheart. And say hi to your sweethearts, too. Falcor and Navi. They were just delights to have around the office. And I was talking about that with a friend the other day where it's like that that collider office when we all had desks there and and, and Grace would bring Ratsy every day and you had your dogs and it was just like a good, well-oiled machine and everybody was hanging out. It was like our little tree house and it's, hello, look at this. Look hello. at all the parties. <laughs> hello. Molly Mark, says, do you have any, any projects you're working on or you would like to promote and let our viewers know about? Um, I'm just raring to get back into uh, comedy clubs. And until that happens, I, I do have a show on Rotten Tomatoes called Versus, where I get to pit two artistic endeavors against each other. Um, so the one I'm working on right now is David Fincher versus Christopher Nolan. So Ooh. that's been a really fun one. I'm going to get that on camera, I think, later this week. And then obviously the movie Trivia Schmodown has been going full steam even with quarantine and everything else going on, we've been able to have virtual matches. And like the virtual matches, I don't know how we've been able to do it, but we capture a lot of what you get to see in studio or even like with a live event because it's fun, it's competitive. These matches are going down to the wire. Our Eric Geekdom tournament just started and we do a, a live one on Twitch every Wednesday that currently is about Star Wars. And so unless my computer crashes like it did 30 seconds before the stream started last week, we, we recovered. It was fine. Then you can join us every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on Twitch. It's just, I think it's twitch.tv slash the schmodown. Yep, that's exactly right. I think I actually follow you guys on Twitch, but I have literally missed it every time because notification comes really late on my phone. So every time I clicked on you guys were ending, I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. I missed the whole show. That's great. Well, luckily, I have your phone number. So <laughs> I can send you a notification before yes. we start. <laughs> Oh, Ellis, it's been so great to see your face. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for an hour. Thank everybody for watching. If you want to follow Ellis, and you should, on Twitter and Instagram, it is, oh, no, it's here. No, it's here. It's like all the way down Mark there. Mark Ellis, live, at Mark Ellis, live. Isn't it funny how we lose all spatial relations when we're trying to point to something like, wait, is Wendy there? No, she's there. I, am I picking Dustin's ear right now? Dustin, oh. what will I? I just went the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> be like, oh no, other hand. There we go. High five. Oh, yes. Uh, Y'all have great fans, by the way. Oh, high five. High five. There we go. There we go. <laughs> hands in. Oh um, Y'all's fans are great. Thank you guys so much for welcoming me into this community. And if you ever are in Southern California, you get a chance to, you're seeing a movie and you see either Wendy or Dustin, they're two of the nicest people you would ever want to meet in person. So say hi or give them like an elbow. However, we're going to greet people from now on. Um, they are two of the really nice, decent people in this space. And you can tell because their dogs are very well behaved. <laughs> Most of the time. Be like, what is it, those high fives that they did in Demolition Man? You know, the... Oh, oh right, right. Yeah. yeah. It's much better than the Top Gun high five where you go up and then there's a chance of hitting your friend's ass as you come down. So you got to practice that one. Yeah, exactly. Oh, such a great stream today. We're going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you so much, Ellis. And thank you, everybody, for your support and for watching. We will catch you on Wednesday for another stream. Bye. See y'all. Say bye, Molly.